So welcome to the third part um, of today's presentation. And this is just going to be, as I say, uh, an open discussion um, amongst different projects and uh, your experiences, or even more importantly, your questions, things that, uh, ideas that this has uh, left you. We can probably kill the So, um, uh, so I'll start. I'll, I'll just lead off here with a little bit um, from the HTTPD project, which is my own experience. Um, we're lucky enough, as I say, to have about 15 very active um, committers who participate regularly on known issues, exploits about the Apache uh, web server, um, and we typically found, I want to say, three three issues a year, uh, three or four. But as as Mark said, in in Tomcat's experience, there's no rhyme or reason to how quickly and how many uh, reports we get, how many different areas are impacted. Um, I would say our most amusing story, or not amusing but embarrassing story, um, is uh, Jeff was reminding me the other day um, at the hackathon that we, we seem to have a, a small issue uh, with um, data tainting. And so our most recent vulnerability that was just fixed in the, in the release this week um, has to do with a, a very mild cross-site scripting vulnerability that if somebody has manipulated the host header, well, at that point, uh, the host header can have whatever cross-site scripting code there that you want. Now, the funny thing is a host name is a pretty specific entity. It's got to be a DNS, um, a valid DNS entry or a valid IP address. You would think that this would be easy to detain and we would never be passing around this little bit of trivia, um, this bad host header. Um, contents that came across, but in fact we did, um, and there were five different modules that were emitting this host header uh, back to the user, reflecting it in one way or another, mod status or whatnot. Um, now the funny thing is we get some very interesting reports to HTTPD on a very regular basis. Uh, one of them is that um, the Apache Foundation has is very, very insecure because we are presenting, all you have to do is go to www.apache.org slash server status. And everybody knows that server status is a vulnerability. Uh, this is a security hole, but in fact it's not. Um, there's one, there is only one potential question of, of the uh, legitimacy of presenting that data. Frankly, we want people to know how our servers run. We may not give them all the details about how we do authentication and such, but in general we want to, we, are, we create this software. We want you to see how it runs, and if your first opportunity is to see Apache itself running, well, that's wonderful. Uh, go, go ahead. You can see our server status. You can um, anybody who's in any project, you can get to the configuration of that web server. You can you can see how your sec section is configured, or how other projects have configured their sections. I'll uh, point out with my infrastructure hat on that that's only enabled for HTTP unauthenticated services. Um, as soon as you're looking at a service over HTTPS or anything on any of the issue trackers, server status isn't available for the obvious reasons we don't want to expose session IDs, passwords, or, or anything else. So it's just for the main ASF website and the TLP websites that are served over HTTP. And, and the only question, and, and, and Mark is perfectly willing to hear your argument later, um, the only question is you can actually associate an IP address with, oh, they're reading the documentation for Tomcat for example. Um, so if, they, if, if somebody considered that a gross privacy violation and can cite the site chapter and verse of the EU privacy law, feel free to take it up with Mark and he'll bring it back to infrastructure to consider. Or not. Or not. Um, some other things. Uh, we, we get a lot of reports that um, uh, Apache does exactly what we said it does. Um, so for example, uh, we, we have a nice little feature, um, options. Um, that allow us to say that if owner match, if symlink owner match, will only follow content for a given user if their user IDs are correct. Um, well, as it turns out, there is a race condition there. There has been a race condition there for 17 years, and there will be a race condition there for the next seven. So this is, but it's well documented, it's spelled out in the documentation, and once a year, at least, maybe twice, we get a report that uh, Apache has a race condition, this is insecure. And in our documentation, we say this is not a security feature. 
This is simply a convenience feature um, and you cannot rely upon it and here is why. Another example of uh, that same class of problem uh, with uh, beyond, beyond the uh, options uh, in Apache in HTTPD is that we have, um, oh, let, me, let me try to come around to where I was coming with that. Um, server? No, I'm gonna, I'm gonna completely lose track of where I was going with that. I will, I will come back to it. Um, but we do have, as I say, a, a number of things that are just not for security. Oh, I'm sorry, HT access. Um, so everyone, uh, one group of problems that we've had periodically, and we've issued CVEs, we've treated these as security holes when we discover that if you do something specific with an HT access file, it'll cause the server to crash, or it'll cause the server to behave in an unexpected way. And the problem is, is that when you can configure a service, when you can manipulate how a service behaves, in general, you can force it, you can cause it to crash. This is true of most Unix services. Um, but HT access is a special thing because content, host, content providers, hosting providers, tend to trust that if you're in the slash customer one director, directory and you're manipulating your contents, you shouldn't be able to cause the server to crash for customers two, three, and et cetera. So people have treated HT access as, oh, well, this is very, very carefully handled. We don't have to worry about customer A affecting customer B, et cetera. And the more we looked at the problem, um, every time we would, we would go and close a security hole or a bug defect, like a PCRE, it turned out we could, we could crash it just by writing the appropriate regular expression. Every time we went to close one of these, we discovered that, oh, but there are seven other ways that we can, through a nefarious means, do something bad with HT access. And so we ultimately came up with a policy not two years ago that says that HT access defects are not security defects. Uh, H, you know, it, is, it is a feature, it's a facility, but you have to understand that as long as you are giving the A user control over what Apache is doing, there is going to always be some risk that they can do something in a malicious way that's then gonna cause that server to fail. And in fact, there is a way to handle this. You simply run multiple instances of Apache, each running as different users, each of them under those customers' accounts. And that is the way to properly, you know, the operating system has user and ownership for a very specific reason. So, um, so those are just some of the things that have happened at HTTPD. Um, I'm wondering uh, some of the other projects uh, represented here. Um, does anybody want to uh, share an as anecdote, uh, anecdote from your project's experience? Yeah, you <laughs> Put you on the spot. Um, do, do, so we can also open this up just generally to questions about how these, how these incidents get handled. Mark gave you some excellent examples of exactly um, what ha the flow of a, one particular case, and, and these all look fairly similar. Um, but does anyone hear from another PMC, maybe, maybe you've just attacked your first security problem or you have a lot of open questions as a PMC about how would this all work relative to your project? Certainly, and, and yeah, absolutely, always feel free to send anything to security at apache.org. Um, as I said, as Mark mentions, I mean, if you send something to security at httpd.apache.org, security at apache.org does see that. Now, it's not that we're the traffic hops of the ASF in terms of security, but we at least get to see a big picture of how are different projects handling these, how are they responding, um, does there need to be some intervention so that, you know, maybe maybe another 
PMC member over there is encouraged to send the responses because these are not so diplomatic coming from this other individual. Uh, we, we like to keep an eye on it at that level. But each project is, in fact, ultimately responsible for their code. And so if you really do encounter a situation where you cannot convince the project members or committers of a project that this is actually a, a, a vulnerability, then perhaps it isn't. At some point, the most efficient, effective way to do it, and we don't, General Mark and I don't, and I, most of us in this room don't believe in zero day disclosure uh, or full disclosure, unlimited um, in impact. But if I'm angry enough at that, I can always- Take it to dev. Take it to dev. Because ultimately when, you know, you've, you've, given, them the, you've given them the ability to, to evaluate this and give it all due consideration, they decide, well, that's just, it's not an issue. Well, then bring, post the same thing you took privately and say, okay, here's what I think is a problem. As a project, shouldn't we consider this? And now they have the scrutiny of the general public, and now they maybe have to give it some more consideration and say, yeah, you know, that default really doesn't sound right, and let's, let's do something about that to make it a little more reliable. Also, don't assume when you email security at that you're talking to all the PMC members. At Apache HTTPD, only 25, 30 of them are actually participating on the security list. We have 100 PMC members uh, historically, and some of them may be easy, e easily convinced that there is a problem where the security list initially didn't. Uh, and what, I would, what I would add to that is I can think of a couple of recent examples which also aren't yet public, where something was reported to an Apache project and the response from the project was, what, what's possibly wrong with that? That's, that's not a problem. And then with, as the security team, you know, I stepped in and said, uh, yeah, it is. The OP is right. You've got a gaping hole here and you need to fix it. Um, so the security team can step in and provide that sort of advice as and when necessary. But they, they need to know what's going on in order to do that. So it needs to be copied to either the project security list or the security of Hatch.org. But for them to actually have an opportunity to step in and say, yeah, that's a problem because... Or explain from another perspective why they agree that it's not an issue. Okay, I'll go back and, and look at it because uh, I... Having the source code available is very nice. Uh, mm -hmm. I just went ahead and it, it's a case of the type of thing where I can write my own subclass, fix it myself, and then my project is no longer vulnerable. Um, and it's not a very complicated fix. So it's not something that's going to take months and months of research to, uh, to, to deal with. And like I. Uh, hey, Bruce, can you just, uh, yeah. I just submit a Jira, create mm -hmm. a patch? I mean, it, they've already it analyzed it and said it's not a problem. So create a patch, make it public, right? Yeah. And treat it as a bug. Maybe they don't, well, you may, they may not agree. It was sort of like the, the recommendation was to change the default. Right. And they were like, well, we don't want to, you know, we don't want to change the default on all our users, so. I'll, yeah. But, but, I'll, I'll bring it back. Sure, right. sure. But I mean, you, you know, if they say this is not a vulnerability, then at some point you just have to say, okay, fine, I'm going to treat it as a defect because it's a defect. I think one message there is it's okay to be annoying on a dev list, which the reason for that is Yeah, we should try to drive some consensus on the kinds of changes and how apps behave and, and be kind to our users and things. But like, uh, security is one card we can play with. Like, no, I really think you know it's worth disrupting the user experience with it, or it's worth pushing a release earlier or something like that. Okay. I mean, you don't you don't have to take it as far as Microsoft did with their, the way they rolled out UAC. I mean, I don't think we have to be that cruel to our users, but. I, eventually you have to say, look, this really, you know, I, we know we made it really easy for you before, but that really wasn't a good idea and we're going to be a little stricter in the future. And we've had our, the default CGI examples at HTTPD. Those used to be turned on. As soon as you installed it, you could do echo and, oh, well, we had some UTF-7 issues because of IE's bug we had. And, and that is actually an interesting point, is that very often you're going to run in and Mark hinted at this with how the, J the Java runtime very often is the root cause of these problems. In the web server's case, it's very often been something that's very specific to IE or something that is specific to certain browsers that, in fact, we <coughs> had nothing to do with it. it we're, we're following the protocol. We, we did exactly what we were promised or what we were told to do by the spec, and the client in this particular case didn't behave. 
my, my most interesting experience myself in, in the security world was when I ended up um, assisting being part of the solution to what we called the HTTP response splitting vulnerability. Um, and basically what this was was if you were very clever in inserting certain carriage returns and other or escaped carriage returns, each and almost each and every web server product, the, every single gateway product out there from everybody from Netscape to Microsoft to Oracle to, well at the time, Sun, all of these had some defect. And none of the defects were the same because every author was trying to be permissive in how they processed the input. So if you got a header and you couldn't quite understand it, maybe they turned it into something that was understandable. The request response splitting vulnerabilities came into play because each of these proxies behaved differently, that they each broke each other's expectations. So they could basically work out that, oh, if you pass this, but only through an Apache web server and only to an IIS server, this is the net impact. And so it was a really fa we, we had to change the rules and basically say, look, the RFC says every line must be terminated with a CRLF. If they violate that, we can no longer be permissive. We're going to have to be very strict about certain patterns, certain behaviors that we expect a browser to have. And if somebody's just maybe typing, you know, we, we all use Telnet to test our web server. Um, and if you don't send a CRLF, fine, it's going to stop working. But um, we needed to become much more strict just so that every other product we interoperated with had a similar set of expectations. And that, that class of bugs took nearly a year to fix when, when you, all of the different actors that were involved or were implicated in one way or another in that they were either accepting things that they shouldn't have or passing things on and decoding things that they shouldn't have. One way or another, they were, we were each doing something slightly different. And that, that in and of itself was the defect. Um, so other, other questions, other? I'm thinking what are good resources for people to follow? I mean, I, I, I follow bug track still and uh, Vault Dev, I think was one, I don't know if it's still active, but uh, yeah. there were lists that uh, uh, are good to follow even if they're talking about vulnerabilities in other people's product, yeah. uh, other products, and, and, and you see on some of these lists kind of debates sometimes between reporters or some, mm -hmm. actually there's a full disclosure list too where you see some of these debates break out in the public. And even if sometimes they're a little silly, they can be very instructive on both the class of bugs to be working for mm -hmm. and, uh, and kind of how to interact, uh, how, how reporters and, and, and uh, vendors should uh, relate to each other. I think. And that's some, what are some other good lists? That I, I, I was going to say, well, Volndev, Volndev and uh, Full Disclosure are amusing in that neither of them really believe that you have to have any sort of um, responsible disclosure. None of the, there, you know, as soon as you see something interesting, you can post it up there and say, hey, but if we just <coughs> saw this behavior, couldn't this become a vulnerability or can't we find a way to exploit this? And you can have these deep philosophical discussions about how can you, what interesting things can you do in manipulating the stack if you actually have a crash. Um, whereas bug track, one of my favorites is a more formalized, I mean, this is where we have a official vulnerability. It is, there is an announcement of it. There probably are vendor responses that are coordinated with it. It probably is not a zero day um, because the zero days tend to get posted out to the other lists, to the uh, full disclosure uh, VolnDev. Those are the three that I use. I don't know, does, it, does anyone else here have other favorite um, security hacking forums? Um, disclosure sites, anything like that? I, I would say full disclosure needs a, a fairly heavy filter on it in mm -hmm. order to get the useful information out of it. Yeah. There, there's a lot of garbage on that list. Yeah. I find just keeping up with traditionalized blog is quite good for general background reading. It's not necessarily going to give you all of it, but if you follow it for a year or so, you can mm -hmm. build up your general knowledge and, and then get to the point where maybe you Point. Is there a place where it's formalized and, and to, so it's just to be easily understandable of when, what, you know, I've said I've identified some situation, how do I determine to what degree that represents a true situation? 
security vulnerability. Well, again, this goes back to the one quote I, I took from the web page in 2001. Are we able, uh, it, it does the vector, um, whatever input you're putting into it, does it cause the machine to spend an inordinate amount of resources in comparison to the amount of resources you had to expend to cause that server to, for that program, service, whatever, to, to have that impact? Right. So, it, and and obviously, there's also, I mean, totally different classes. We have disclose. We have data disclosure. We have uh, vulnerabilities which actually allow you to manipulate, um, uh, destroy, or corrupt records, and so forth. And specifically, I'm, I'm thinking in terms of the large number of Java projects we have at the foundation, and of course, there's the whole you know, landscape of the Java access controller security APIs. And so right. On. Okay. When. Once you start talking about the Java Security Manager and issues with that, for starters, I would argue that the vulnerabilities are in the JVM, um, not in the product. So well, if you <coughs> have a product that is explicitly, you know, specifically the, the potential problem situation is if you use the access controller APIs to, to invoke some code with access mm -hmm. allowed, but then you make the, the method that does those things public. Yeah, then you, you will have a problem, yeah. Um, is that the type of problem that, that is escalatable to a CVE? And if it's mm -hmm. exploitable. Um, I mean, the caveat being, if it's exploitable, then yes, it would be. Um, because you'd be able to do, you know, you'd be able to do so, you'd be able to either manipulate a file or read a file you shouldn't be able to remit, read or delete a file you shouldn't be able to delete. Um, so it, there is an element of can you actually ex exploit it? Somehow. And I think it's okay for, you don't necessarily have to have working code but you need to have at least some idea of how it might be exploitable, um, rather than a, oh, I found this code that looks like this, and I'm sure that must be a problem, without any rational explanation of how it might be I would say exploitable. Right now, I'm, I'm aware of several discussions taking place in the open of, of known vulnerabilities of this type that are, and yes, we're trying to address those, and eventually we will, but there's not really a sense of urgency associated with them from the security perspective. I mean, let me take, for example, uh, a lot of the defects in SSL, um, the computational theoretical uh, defects, all have basically boiled back down to having, being able to measure to microseconds the uh, computational time that a given encryption takes. So as soon as you know that it's uh, uh, this complex or this simple and you can compare, you can actually begin to walk through and begin to narrow your hash or narrow um, the, the data set that you're evaluating because it's, as long as you have to work out every one of those 2048 bits and a 2048 bit encryption, great, it's gonna take you a very long time. But as soon as you can say, well, yeah, but I can throw away these, these 75 bits are just garbage. I mean, we know, we know where they're gonna come from. We know they're based on a clock. We know they're based on whatever. All of a sudden the problem, you know, you keep shrinking the number of bits. This is why MD5 or the, the hash is useless now. Because it's, uh, I think the problem set is now, what, 64 bits, 68 bits out of 80? Um, they slowly just chopped off the, pro the tr computational problem. But as I say, um, Lucky 13, which is a new TLS uh, vulnerability, and this entire class of problem is that if you can measure, and it used to be that, fine, if they have a local account, potentially they are going to be able to use that information against the server that they have a local account on. At this point with gigabit, e gigabit ethernet, with the way that the data centers are structured now, you can get those millisecond timings you know, somewhere in the same building, somewhere in the same county. Um, you don't actually need the same physical presence that you used to have to have to make those kind of computational timing attacks. So uh, it, what, what, is, what is a vulnerability today it, what, what, was a what was not a vulnerability yesterday can be a vulnerability today just by that, the very virtue that people have different tools, um, that the nature of, compu of uh, computing has changed. I mean, going back to um, Java Security Manager and things that that lets you do and discussions in the public, I mean, it depends on sort of how easy those things are to exploit as to you know, how much of a problem it is that there's, some, there's a discussion happening in dev. And I personally, I don't think I have a problem about a discussion on the dev list about a highly theoretical that 
we can't really see a way to exploit it, but we think there might be an issue here. At kind of that kind of discussion on the dev list is probably okay, as long as you're planning on fixing it fairly soon. Because chances are, at some point, somebody might figure out a way to use it. Um, but it's, again, there's judgment and there's balance. And if you get more people looking at it on the dev list, then that the extra eyes are potentially a benefit. But you know, the, the attackers are looking as well, so you, it's. It, it is an element of judgment. I certainly, it would be worth um, having a quick look at those issues and seeing if there's anything obviously exploitable. What you then also get into, sort of in the in the Tomcat realm, um, is we often look at issues. Well, that's only an issue if I don't trust the web application code that's running on Tomcat. Right, that's, that's sort of the main and there are there is a very very small group of users that that's a problem for. They're either the extremely paranoid, where organizations do not tr completely trust their own developers. Um, you know, some you know, big financial institutions, that's the case. Um, or you're in a sort of a virtual hosting <coughs> environment where you've got one JVM that's hosting apps from multiple customers, where you know, customer A clearly isn't gonna trust customer B. Um, and for Tomcat, what we generally do is those are the sorts of issues where actually this is this affects such a small proportion of our users that we'll, we'll announce that publicly and we'll fix it in a subsequent release. And we do fix them, but we tend to announce it first particularly, and say, look, this is a potential issue, you need to watch <coughs> for this, you need to watch for that. Like it's normally pretty, pretty easy to detect. Um, but you do or don't apply for a CVE in those cases? Yes, we do. We apply for a CVE, but we'll, announce it, we'll often announce it before we do a release. Um, and that's, to some extent, that that's driven by the fact that if you're in a security conscious environment and you're using Tomcat, by far the simplest solution is to run multiple instances. Um, that's far more secure um, and will get you far more because the OS will then do a lot of the protection for you. Um, so generally our recommendation is, well, that's what you should be doing anyway, really. So that's, it's, we view it as less of a risk. Um, because there's very few situations where you have really untrusted apps running side by side in the same JVM. Um, so if that's what's the sort of thing that's being discussed, then I think that's probably okay to discuss it on the dev list. But yeah, you, probably, you will need CVEs if they're exploitable and they do need to be fixed. And when, you, and when we do get into something like uh, Beast or Prime or we, we get into um, the Lucky 13, these TLS issues, they're, they're ecosystem-wide. They, there is no Band-Aid. We cannot fix this tomorrow. There is no way to, I mean, we, it takes potentially years. Uh, I do, myself, I work in a secure government environment. Mm -hmm. It is uh, governed by the security rules of the FBI and the United States Department of Commerce mm -hmm. and U.S. Department of Defense and other homeland security issues. And one of the reasons why the agency I work for has not gone to XML-based communications and web services is because of the vulnerabilities inherent in the specifications mm -hmm. on what constitutes a doc type definition and what constitutes an external entity and when is an external entity referenced and expanded. And how well do you reference your URLs in absence of a trusted URL entity dictionary? Yeah, yeah and Tomcat has had um, a number of vulnerabilities around um, external explanations in that you could, you could do you know, all sorts of interesting things from just reading the ETC password file. Um, there's another interesting one where you could, um, just back to this, and two hundred untrusted apps running side by side, but you could replace the XML parser that was used by another app, which would then let you read all the, that other app's configuration file, which included things like database passwords, could get quite interesting quite quickly. But there are, and the XML external entity thing um, is, a, you know, is an issue that affects lots of things in lots of different ways. For Tomcat, we, have, we explicitly have our, our, our own um, configuration for handling that, which is basically, yeah, we don't like um, you can't, anything that's happened by that, we have window control rather than having a free range to insert anything you like. But yeah, there are, there are lots of issues like that. Um, 
just following up what Bill was saying about the, the XL stuff, when you get onto some of that, some of the sort of the SSL denial of service stuff starts to get quite interesting. So, well, is that really a vulnerability? Is yes, I can I can do this thing that triggers a fair amount of computation on the server, but I can do almost the same thing with a valid request. Mm -hmm. So, is there really any difference to using this thing that okay, it looks a little bit naughty and a little bit sneaky, but it's really no different to sending a hundred valid requests in a row. So, at what what point does it become a vulnerability? And then you back to that definition of um, non-linear response based on the size of the inputs. Uh, Microsoft has even documented that if you bind your SQL server to your <coughs> IIS server and in such a way, you can send a basic HTTP GET mm. uh, followed by the URL of the system, followed by any uh, select string that would divulge mm -hmm. the entire contents of the server plus all of its databases. Yeah, we, we see this all the time. And it, the problem is basically detainting. We, we, we have to trust that all the information coming over the wire is tainted, uh, that, that we can't trust a bit of it. But then we assume that, for example, the UTF-8 bug, we assume that we actually, when we say uh, if substring uh, the word select, case insensitive, and we don't even anticipate that, oh, by the way, there are under UTF-8 potentially six other di or five other different ways of representing the letter S that that test will always miss. Yeah, so there are ways to re represent the character, the null character, which is an invalid UTF, which is an invalid UTF character. Yes, exactly. And so when when Sun made it very permissive that it would accept all five of these, but the spec says the UTF-8 spec for years has said warning caveat. If you allow all of these different forms to coexist, you are never going to be able to write a security um, restriction. You'll never be able to blacklist these things. And, and they go into basic design decisions like, am I going to whitelist or am I going to blacklist? Well, we, we know what happens when we get the blacklist wrong, so maybe the whitelist makes more sense. Um, but you're right. I mean, and, and the, I think you made a very good point. It, the whole problem of defective by design, I mean, is a very serious problem. And, the nice thing is, is that we are open source. And where I kind of wanted to take this was, we, the advantage here is that we are peer reviewed. The advantage here is, is that we, can, we have each other um, to be each other's you know, next set of eyeballs and say, you know, that was a really nice idea, but I don't think it's actually going to be effective when we start applying this problem. And without, without that openness, um, the only other, the only possibly similar example is when you, when you have a purely academic environment and you have that sort of peer review going on. Um, but certainly, I mean, everybody gets a little chuckle out of, oh, wow, I just found a bug in your software. You know, and uh, hopefully it's all in good fun. And sometimes, you know, it, when you realize that, oh, this has unintended consequences, yeah, this is why security ad exists, so that we can have this discussion quietly. But afterwards, it's always, it makes sense to bring that back to the list and have the public discussion of why was this this way? Why did, what other exploits are there? I mean, we very often will take something and classify it as a low priority vulnerability and three weeks later it is a high priority vulnerability. And then um, two months later it's critical because now we've found other, other extremes or other, other approaches. And, and again, I mean, you, we've, we have things like the PNG vulnerability, which, you know, it's, oh, by the way, we just never anticipated that when we said that this byte has to be C4, that anybody would ever put something other than C4 in that byte. And so this is, I mean, and these things can be very, very widespread. The question is, 
what, what is my experience as an open office user if I open an illegitimate document and it crashes the browser and doesn't otherwise, you know, doesn't have the opportunity to execute code, it just crashes. Is that a vulnerability? Well, I just restart the, the browser, you know, it's sort of the uh, fail whale approach to computing. But then again, if I'm running a service and I'm using that very same decoder so that I can turn that doc into an HTML for one of hundreds of users, that does seem to me to be a vulnerability. But going back to that question about yeah, how excessive does the processing need to be, mm -hmm. I, think, I think you're right to look at it in the context of, well, yeah, is there a valid file of a similar size that would take more processing, in which case this, this one over here is probably just a bug, but if you've got a, a malformed file that takes us on orders of magnitude more processing than valid ones of a similar size, then it, that's probably heading towards a vulnerability. I think the, the further it gets, the, sort of the further it gets away in terms of how much more processing is required, then the further it gets up the severity chart in terms of it's a denial of service. But I think it starts off at the outset just a bug. Um, and where you draw those lines is really sort of up, up to the, the project to, to decide. But from a, with my security team hat on, I would sort of expect that if there was a, a file that if it was malformed required you know, orders of magnitude <coughs> more processing than any valid file, then I'd probably expect to see a CVE attached to that. But yeah, it's, 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 it's yet, yet another judgment call. I was going to say another, another interesting, uh, as a developer, and especially as a developer of libraries that are going to be consumed by developers, I think one thing we can do is even if we're not going to declare each of these things to be vulnerabilities, that doesn't mean that we can't point out in the documentation that, by the way, this is an unexpected side effect of processing this sort of input is that you should not trust this particular library or this particular method to do what you're thinking it's doing. It, it could potentially use quite a bit more resources than you were expecting. Yeah, there's, a, there's an example of that in the, or a sort of example like that in the Tomcat docs. Um, it says, don't, it, you know, directory listings are turned off by default in Tomcat, not because we think directory listings are insecure, but because the, just the way we generate them, if you've got large numbers of files in a directory, you can cause a denial of service because it takes a lot of processing. So they're disabled by default for that reason. You know, we, we discussed that in docs, those are the consequences and people get to make the decision as to whether to, or not to enable it. Um, it doesn't stop people reading it as oh, directory listings must be insecure because Tomcat's disabled them for security reasons. Or not quite. You need to read a little bit beyond that and understand why. Um, I personally, I, I just don't see how a directory listing can be a vulnerability, but that's yet another debate. It's, it just also gets to the point that the definition of a security vulnerability changes over time. I mean, denial of service attack used to not be considered something worthy of, you know, or something that caught, allowed for a DOS wasn't necessarily accelerate a release or be considered a vulnerability because you weren't actually able to break in and steal any data. You were just, it was the equivalent of processing in front of the Exxon headquarters or something <laughs> like that, right? Um, but then we also had an internet where we used to have email servers be open relays. So, you know, yeah. things have changed. Uh, things have, uh, do change over time. So. Uh, time for two last short observations or questions and then we're going to... Whoever you like onto that, they don't even need to be committers. Mm -hmm. I think you 
you might get some slightly raised eyebrows, but if, and I think you can also then get to the point, if their contribution to your project in terms of security, why, why don't you make them commissions anyway, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but there are definitely some things you can, you can do there, <coughs> whether it is by, by making them PMC members or having a separate list. But creating a separate list is a, is a quick job to do. It's very easy to get yourself if you're looking for that. And if you do okay. find that you need just some extra help, um, you know, could somebody have a look at this or could somebody validate what we're trying to do here? And you know, ping us an email to the security team and uh, hopefully somebody will have some time to take a quick look. But, but also the, okay. the ethic of being on a PMC is that you're taking kind of collective responsibility for the project. And, and from time to time, especially when it's security issues, working on the things that may not be personally interesting, but doing that as a sense of responsibility, right? So I just, I, in response to the concern that you had that sometimes it seems like some of the PMC members aren't interested in addressing security issues. Uh, that's a cultural kind of thing that if we can debug that, uh, may it be a matter uh, as a response. Okay. Very last comment. Yeah, I, this actually extends from the question I asked you between the breaks, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, Oh, okay. I, I think, as I said at the break, one of the things we could probably do better is to share that information between projects. Um, there's a couple of factors that I mean, so the, all of the projects that Tomcat consumes, um, and they're mostly from Commons, we've got people in Commons that are both contributing to them and keeping an eye if there's anything that's of a security concern. And you know, we've been able to take advantage of that. Um, historically there have been a couple of issues with Commons Demon that you know, we've known about in advance because we have people in Commons working on Commons Demon. Um, so that model definitely works, but it does require, so it places a responsibility on the consuming project to do the work. Um, I think the consumed projects could do a little bit more to publish the issues, and certainly Tomcat is pretty bad at telling Geronimo or Tommy that there's a security problem. Um, and arguably, we, should, we could be a little better at that. Counter argument being, they've got members on their PMCs, they can read our security lists if they want to. I, I was even going to suggest, as a one roundabout way to go, is that we could actually, right now, every security at list goes to security at Apache.org. There isn't anything that says that security at Tomcat couldn't also be mirrored and replicated to security at uh, Geronimo or security at other downstream consumers if if it would bring those people in to solve the like, problem. To be honest, if, they, if somebody from Geronimo said, could we sign up to your security list, I don't yeah. really see us saying no, to be honest. Right. They actually helped out and were doing useful yeah. stuff. Uh, yeah, I would suggest, <clears throat> often when a vulnerability is discovered, a new kind of vulnerability, you know, people will look at that and go, well, that might apply to these other projects. It might apply to, in, in other languages, because often they're protocol levels or packs or whatever. And mm -hmm. so, you, you know, most, I don't know if we announced every software update on Apache and every security related kind of thing perhaps gets pushed there or uh, any the, of them. The recommendation is that every security vulnerability when published goes to users list, dev list, project announce list, Apache announce list, bug track and full okay. disclosure. So a good practice, while I'm adding to my list of shoulds, you know, in this <laughs> session which is too long, um, but a good practice would be that uh, for developers, pretty much anybody in the ASF to follow uh, uh, announce an Apache org and when you see a vulnerability, even in a, pro in a project you've never heard of before, look at that vulnerability, look at the class of that vulnerability, and ask yourself, might that apply to us? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be a sensible thing to do. Well, I want to thank everyone for all of your contributions to this uh, discussion um, and for attending, and I hope you all walked away with uh, some new insight and some new ideas about uh, 
how to approach it. We do have two more security talks coming up after the lunch. Uh, and then we're going to break into uh, Nick's Fast Feather content. Uh, not his personally, but uh, you can find out all about uh, incubator projects uh, later on this afternoon. So thank you all.